would like to take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Katie. We again appreciate you to come in. And my name is Zubair Bakubye. And also, I'm a member of who we are One United, and I'm with the director of social enterprise and employment programs uh, in our organization, We Are One United. Please, you're welcome, introduce yourself, and then you can pick it up from there. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Kate, um, and it is a pleasure to be here. I am sorry, my dog is barking in the background, and I'm really hoping that she will end that soon. Um, I have um, a pretty vast background in social services, um, but most recently I um, am the director of uh, uh, I am the chair of field education for Tarzana Treatment Centers College, where we provide um, a certificate for drug and alcohol counselors. And my job is to place those counselors in the field um, if they are not already working in the field, and then making sure that they get all the necessary training that will make sure that they are the best counselors out there. Um, today, um, I'm going to be talking about dealing with difficult people. With the holidays coming up, we all have um, probably somebody that's a little difficult. I've got my dog right now in the background and also my roommate who knew that I was going to have to do this at six o'clock, who just happened to walk through the door that set the dog off. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and hopefully share my screen. So dealing with difficult people. And just so you know that, you know, I am also a family member. I am a mom. Um, and so I could be one of those difficult people that you will encounter. So this isn't just with anybody, with family members. It can be friends. It can be with colleagues. So this is pretty universal. So we normally call somebody difficult if we have a conflict with them. If there is something that we see that is challenging, um, we label them as difficult. So sometimes we need to take a look at, is that person difficult or is the situation something that's difficult to handle? So this is based upon a perception and not necessarily reality. So personality, think about your personality. There's distinctive patterns and thoughts and emotions that vary across culture. Um, I tend to be an extrovert. When I was young, I was very shy. Um, I think I'm friendly. When I was younger, I wasn't. Um, I, right before the pandemic, I started working in retail. I, as a social worker, I do 500 different things. That's how social workers roll. Um, and I, one of my many jobs is running a gift department in, um, a, in my local hardware store. I'm the buyer. So I'm the one that gets all the merchandise and I set it up. I, you know, I do all of that. I, I work with the customers. And when I started working in retail, I realized that I really wasn't friendly before that. And I was probably pretty demanding as a customer and was probably really difficult to work with when frustrated. And so when I started working on a different level, I started to see how my personality has evolved. Um, have you guys, how many of you guys are shy? You can raise I your hand. I am quite shy. You are shy. Okay. What makes you shy? Um, I'm okay. So I don't know. It's a very, uh, odd dynamic. I also, um, was in retail for a number of years, store manager and district manager. Um, and in that environment, I could, I would not be shy. So I would be outgoing and, uh, you know, gregarious and I could deal with customers and, um, all the dynamic of being in that environment. Um, but you know, I kind I I feel most comfortable um, when I'm 
not in that environment. So I was happy when I was working, but then I would come home and I would kind of decompress and, you know, okay, yes, honey, leave me alone. I just need some time to be by myself um, because I really have to kind of turn it on in order to be, uh, you know, engaging with people all day. Right. So you you were per, kind of in a performance. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. Anyone else shy? I am totally shy. I think I always was. It's like, you know, when you when someone you order something and then give you the wrong order, I usually would not say anything. So we've been trying to work on it. So at least say something or I'm only kind of capable of talking out if I'm in a company of people that I know. Okay. But I was also kind of forced to work on it. Thank thankfully, thanks to working for nonprofits because a lot of places require me to give a speech. So at mm-hmm. least I'm pretty good with the public speaking now. But those like small things that kind of concern me, like asking for a better order or like going somewhere, I use my husband to do it because he's extrovert. But he, he's trying to kind of train me. Okay. How many of you guys are extroverts? Do we have any extroverts in the room? Um, yeah, I would definitely say I'm an extrovert. <laughs> okay. And has that served you well? I mean, I, I think so. I, I love talking to people and socializing and meeting people. And I think it helps like, later on because like, you you've formed connections. Yeah. How about demanding? Anybody have to deal with demanding personalities in their family? Or at work? We all work. Yeah, I think definitely at work. Yeah, definitely at work. <laughs> we all have that one demanding person. Um, and are they difficult? Sometimes. Yeah, I would agree. De- definitely. <laughs> I definitely. I have a family member who's more of like the matriarch of our family, but some of her demands are just like, what are you thinking? <laughs> but you just roll with it sometimes and you just, you know, know they're coming from a different perspective than you and you just let it slide. Yeah. Don't, you know, um, don't take it personally and just know. It's small pickings, like it's a small thing to go, you know, to challenge it. So just let it, let it go, move on. That's that's exactly what I'm about to talk about today. Sometimes we just got to let those, those slide. So, so there's, there are changes to our, our personality. We talked about how sometimes there's situational influences at work. I can be this way at home. I'm another way. Um, we also have to change the way in which we respond and react to situations. We've heard of emotional intelligence, right? You guys have heard of that um, EI um, and people who are emotionally intelligent are not reactive. I'm still working on that. I tend to get very reactive. Um, But also what we're seeing is that differences in personality are more related to your generation, what like cohort and year you're born in, as opposed to your chronological age. How many of you guys watch TikToks about different generations? I'm a I'm an I'm a Gen Xer. So I, I watch videos on Generation X and you know they say we raised ourselves and you know all of these things. And I'm li- looking at that and I'm like, yeah, yeah. How many people are millennials? I don't feel like I fit in one. I feel like I fit across multiple ones, but um, I probably am a mix of Gen X and millennial. You're on the cusp. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm and then, a millennial. I you're think. a millennial? Okay, what does I'm millennial a- mean to you? Uh, I think it's more like kind of, the way I see it is most like it relates to something of cultural things in a mm-hmm. way because my background doesn't exactly make me economically millennial because we have still much better than our parents had but like culturally and kind of like growing up with the old stuff and then growing up with the new stuff like getting interned when we were still teens and kind of learning with the both worlds 
in a way. And then we also connect on like cultural phenomena as they go like growing up with Harry Potter, growing up with Lord of the Rings. So it's like the, we kind of catch ourselves within these groups. And I still have friends that I only found out thanks to these cultural phenomena. So. Okay. My daughter is a Gen Z. Um, Gen Z? That's the, the most recent, aren't they? Those, because my daughter is 23. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm noticing is that they're real sensitive. Maybe. Yeah. Gen X is, we're thing. like, brush it off, keep it moving, go. You know, you're still alive. It didn't hurt that bad. Where Gen Z is, is very emotional. They really need to process a lot of things. And so that I, I see that causing conflict among the generations but it's the gen xers who re who created the gen z so there are big the big five personality factors there's your neurotics your extroverts your openness to the experience your agreeables and your conscientiousness um do you, you can be more than one at one time, I think. And these are not personality disorders. You are not being diagnosed or putting into any of these factors, <laughs> but it's kind of like where we're looking at how these personality factors fit with different people and how it is that they can cause conflict. And my goal is to avoid conflict, right? That's exactly what we don't want to get into in the holiday season. When I was fresh out of uh, my undergrad program, I worked for a mental health company um, and people would call in right after the holidays because they had spent time with their family and they needed to go to counseling. <laughs> and I always thought, well, why do you go? You know, can you just call out sick? Um, I come from a very small family so it wasn't like I really had to deal with large family conflict and, and personalities, but I definitely did have some, some different personalities growing up in my family. So the, the first one, the neurotics, they tend to be more, um, they tend to have anxiety, hostility, depression, self-consciousness, impulsivity, vulnerability. So these people tend to trigger us. And you got any of those in your family, in your workplace? Where there's that one person who, whose anxiety just mm -hmm. makes your anxiety a little bit over the board, overboard? Yes, I do have someone like that. Not Someone present. that you can say yes in case they listen to this. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's that one person that you want to take a Xanax before you deal with them. Yeah. So those, so that's the, at least you kind of know what their characteristics look like. So when they're on their changes to personality on the low end, they can be calm. They can be even tempered or on the high end, they can be the complete opposite. Sometimes you don't know which person you're going to get. Um, there was a person that my sister worked with and her name was Arlene and they used to call it Arlene Roulette. They didn't know what person was going to walk into the office that day. Then you have me, the extrovert. Mm. I love interaction i love to present maybe that's why i've been a professor for over 20 years i i enjoy that so people who are extroverts are they're warm they're you know assertive we also are attention seekers um we like to be the center of attention so there's those good things that are great about extroverts we're like yeah they're the life of the party but are they tiring can they be overwhelming? Can they create anxiety like the neurotic person beforehand? Especially to you introverts, right? We're overbearing. We could be aggressive. You want to yeah. put us on mute.
so you'll start to see changes over time on the low end. They're, they could be a little bit more um, passive on the high end. They're, they want to be, they want to join, they are active, they're affectionate. They're, they can be fun to be around, but they can also be way too much. And you want to pump the brakes there, pumpkin. Openness to the experience. They tend to be receptive to new ideas, approaches, and experiences. I was in Florida this past week um, visiting my daughter and her partner. Um, and my daughter is an extrovert. My daughter works for Disney. My daughter works in Disney Entertainment. So if that could even tell you um, kind of a snapshot of my child. My daughter's partner is the complete opposite. And they're not open to experience. My daughter's partner hates Disney, hates theme parks, you know, does not like anything that is not predictable and comfortable. And so I don't understand how these two have been together for two years. It's very weird to me. Opposites attract. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, my boyfriend is open to experience. He is very outgoing. He's an extrovert. He tends to, you know, want to do different things. And it, he's a um, he's in the music industry. So he's an artist. So he has all of these ideas and all of these things that very open to the experience do you guys have anybody that's like this and you're the opposite uh, my husband is a complete extrovert he's a, like the life of the party mm -hmm. everywhere you go he's always will be telling the jokes talking always kind of a open like super super open and i'm good with social situation but he's like the in the front of everything <laughs> like, he doesn't mind he kind of he craves like being on put on the spot so he mm -hmm. can kind of like shine and with me I'm kind of like okay just kind of sitting around talking to one person for a whole hour so yeah it's it's kind of I guess opposite attracts it's totally yeah he enjoys it yeah mm -hmm. and 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 in those can be good in certain situations and bad in other situations right again we need to decompress. We need our downtime. Um, but in dealing with family, especially during the holidays, everything is on hyper overdrive, right? Because you got to be positive. It's the holidays and you got to say hi to this person and you got to say hi to that person. And it becomes a little overwhelming. How do changes in openness happen? So in on the low side, people will tend to be um, down to earth, curious, and then on the high side, there's, um, we don't really see too many opposites like we did with the other personality. And again, these change with age. So as a person ages, because we all have that older person in our family, right? And that older person is getting a little bit more difficult to deal with. You know why? because they no longer have a filter. Because there's two groups of people in this world that will tell you the truth, and those are kids and elderly people. <laughs> and then there's the agreeableness. These are easygoing, trusting, and generous. They're straightforward. They're tender-minded. They have some modesty. But then as they age, what happens? That might not necessarily be as much. And they might on the low side become critical and irritable. So let's, I'm gonna go back a slide. How many of you guys have family and friends that you would put in or yourself that you would put in this category? And you can be in more than one category depending on the situation. Are yeah, I think I'm in the agreeableness as well. I like that. <laughs> I agree. And then the conscientious. They're ambitious and self-disciplined. Um, 
how many of you guys have people that are very self-disciplined? That's the one thing I'm lacking. If I don't have a schedule, I might, I, I'm the type of person that needs to have a schedule because if left up to my own devices, nothing's going to get done. During mm -hmm. semester breaks, I would have a semester break for um, like six weeks. So there was no teaching. So I would be off for six weeks. That's when I can clean out my closet. I can do all of these things. And guess what got done? nothing. But when I'm on a 40 hour work week, <laughs> I can manage to get all of that stuff done. I would say this is my work personality. Okay. At home, different story. I mean, priorities happen, but then like the things that aren't top priority, like say, I have a guest coming in two in a week and a half. The three days before I will clean like crazy, but this week leading up to it, I really take my time <laughs> and then like kick it into gear because, oh shoot, it's, I only have three days or one day left. So work-wise I'm, this is me at home. I'm probably more down to, no, not down to earth. Um, the opposite. We'll just say the opposite. Yeah. The opposite. Yeah. Um, when I was, when I was writing my dissertation, you know, everybody said, you need to schedule an hour a day and it needs to be the same hour. And I'm like, yeah, you know, yeah, I got it. When I was writing my dissertation, I found the time to, by myself, re-landscape. Didn't need to re-landscape, but I did. Because I did not, I could not be disciplined and put in order and make sure that I was doing the things that I needed to do. That landscape has since died in the drought, but my dissertation is complete. So on the low end, we have lazy, disorganized. I wouldn't say I was lazy, but I was definitely disorganized. And I don't like the term lazy. Um, I think lazy probably comes from maybe the baby boomers who were, you know, constantly going, going, going. Um, I think it's okay to pause and rest. And make um, priorities. Yeah. But, it's not your priority in the moment. <laughs> right. Um, because I don't think Gen X, if we were not constantly moving, we were considered lazy. Um, and I think we need to kind of really re-evaluate the word, what the word lazy means. Because we really do need to rest and take care of ourselves. Um, hardworking, well-organized, and persevering. Yeah. I like to say that's my, that's my work persona. Yeah. Like you said, that is definitely my work persona. Okay. So remember, difficult is a term that we use to label people that we have issues with. So we, the types of difficult people, we have the bulldozer. And those ones just kind of come in and take over. We all have one of those somewhere. Whether it's, you know, at a family dinner and they're reorganizing everything and they're taking control and they're the ones who are telling, okay, you have ice duty. You no longer get to get the potato salad because you messed it up last year and you're off mashed potato duty. The one thing you cannot mess up is soda and ice. So that's your duty. You have the bullies, right? You guys have bullies at work? No. In the past, I definitely have. <laughs> like, wow. Okay. The bully is the one that you don't want to get on the bad side of, right? And then they're, they're the one, the bully in the group is always the one who's like, there they are. They're going to point at the person to make sure that 
everybody is on their side against that one person. And everybody kind of stays clear of the bully. Want to be on the bully's best side because you don't want to be on the receiving end. You have the, the staller and the waffler who's kind of, oh, I don't know. Make a decision. I need you to make a decision. Are we meeting at two or are we meeting at three? Pick a time. You guys are laughing. You've experienced that? I think I've said that. Pick a time, tell me. I say it all the time when I'm driving, pick a lane. I need you to pick it and commit. The, the, the stallers are very annoying, especially when you're trying to plan something, get together. Um, you know, that's also, you know, like um, I took a class on like decision making and there was, you know, how people come to decisions and they talked about, you know, let's go to lunch. Okay, where do you want to go? Oh, it, it, it doesn't matter. You can pick. What? How about Mexican? No, I had that for dinner last night. You want to do Chinese? No, I don't like Chinese. <laughs> Is it, well, then pick one. Was somebody going to say something? No, I was just laughing because I definitely know some of those people as well. So then you do the garbage pail or the garbage the decision making where you just throw it all in there and then hopefully one will 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 be good. You have the control freaks. When I first um, started teaching, uh, not, not when I first started teaching, when um, when I was a Girl Scout leader. I remember I was very much a control freak on what happened and how it happened and you couldn't do this. And, and then the control freaks kind of take the fun out of everything. They take the spontaneity out of everything. Um, where I am in my professional life this week is the, I'm, it's not up to me. I have decided it is not my monkey. It is not my circus. Go ahead. You can make a decision not up to me not it those are not necessarily the most agreeable people to deal with because they've checked out but sometimes you need to check out when you got a super control freak or a bulldozer or a bully right are you difficult You don't have to answer that question, but I want you to think about it. Most difficult people are detail oriented and they are equipped to argue their point. My daughter's partner is a difficult person. <laughs> they know everything everything and will argue their point. And I really want to tell them I'm 51 years old. I've been around the block. I have three degrees. There are things that I still don't know, but I don't want to get your opinion on this. So maybe I'm the difficult person. Maybe. Difficult people often exploit others' emotions to render these people off balance and vulnerable. I call those the bomb setters. Those are the ones that walk in, they set the bomb, they let people go you know, crazy, and then they sit back and they watch. Have we seen those? especially in a work setting, right? They instigate, they create chaos, and then they sit back and they watch it. 
families do that all the time. I was just going to say that's my grandma. <laughs> and has she gotten worse over time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And how do you deal with her? Um, I mean, I just, I acknowledge what she says, but I kind of brush it off at the same time. Yeah. So basically what you need to know is that you're not here. This presentation is just to kind of give you an idea of all, how all of these different people work, but not to give you the tools to change them. The one thing that I have learned in my 51 years on this planet is people do not change. We get into relationships thinking, oh, it's okay. I can change them. No, you can't. That's why I'm not married. Mm -mm. You're not going to change anybody. But what I can do is I can validate somebody's feelings. I don't have to agree with them to validate them. I hear that you're really frustrated. That's got to be a lot. I'm not there to change their mind. I'm there to validate. Because at the end of the day, the one thing you want to hear is somebody say, I hear you. I understand you're frustrated. I could see that would be really challenging for you. Because think about it, when you're angry, and we've all been angry, um, like if we've called a store or something has happened and we're angry, we just want to tell our story. And we don't want you to fix it. I just want to tell my story. How many of you guys have driven to work and you have hit every red light? <laughs> and, ah! Why? Why today of all days? And you'll call your friend and you'll tell them about the situation and then they'll try to fix it or they'll try to one-up you when all they could say is, you know what, that's really frustrating. We just want to be validated. And so instead of trying to change somebody or engage in a power struggle, my advice to you is just to validate. Common mistakes we make. This took me a long time. Took me a long time. Not everyone's gonna like us. When I first started out in the working world, I wanted everyone to like me. Now I don't care. I realize that I'm not for everyone. Um, when I first started teaching, if there was that one, and it was always that one student that would give me a bad evaluation. And I used to take it personally. And then I realized my style is not for everybody. Not everyone's going to agree. We always need to have an exit line. Do you guys have an exit line? For when things get a little too much and you got to go? My roommate's exit line on the phone is, let me let you go. I like that one. Instead of saying, I have to go, let me let you go. We need to check our response to negative feedback. Ooh, that's a hard one. I'm still working on that one. Because I still want to justify. Yeah, but. And we need to separate the person from their behavior. Like your grandma. I was going to say, well, that and sometimes it's hard to take what someone's saying and not take it personally or as an attack on your own beliefs. Because words are very powerful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Negative or positive, they are very powerful. And I wish I could say, you know, just brush us off, brush it off. Because when we were kids, they said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We all know that the hurt, 
those words sting longer than actually getting a broken bone. Because also those words will continue to haunt us and they're going to shape our interaction the next time. Because we brace ourselves for impact when we walk through that door, right? Because I already know. I know when I get together for Thanksgiving, um, I'm an only child and all of my family is deceased except for my daughter, but I have somebody that I grew up with. I call her my sister and our grandparents go back way back. Um, and so we've always done the holidays together growing up. And I know I'm gonna get there and her mom is going to be really friendly and then she's going to start to get really angry and pissy and rude and then my sister and her mom are going to get into a fight somebody else is going to get drunk and leave you know how many of you guys can play out those family situations that are going to happen it's almost scripted for every single holiday everybody has their role right? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because we all have that one uncle that no one wants to talk about. And so we need to be able to separate the person from the behavior, at least in the beginning of the evening. Whew. So that was the end of my presentation. And again, it was just to kind of give you guys some ideas to look at how people, uh, how people, you know, personalities affect things. And also for you guys to kind of take a look at how your own personality plays into those factors. I am by no way an expert of dealing with difficult people. I probably am a difficult person. Um, but I was just kind of here to give you guys some tools and some ideas going forward in the workplace or in public or with your family this holiday season. Does anybody have any questions? I would like really to appreciate you when I look at uh, separate the person from their behaviors. How do we do that and where do we bring in the issue of accountability? Because then if we separate them from their behaviors, let's say maybe they're thieves or whatever, a lot of stuff, how are okay. they going to account for their behaviors? Okay, so the, during the holiday, probably not a good time to have people account for anything, right? We wanna just get through the holidays. Um, I would say, I want you to pick your battles. Is this something that is worth your time and effort? Because yeah, holding I think somebody that a lot of times, you know, dealing with these situations, I, you said it earlier, and now I can really kind of see um, the connection, you know, because if you do have a lot of, um, you know, I don't really care for conflict. So if you have a lot of, you know, conflict in your childhood or whatever, I think that that's what kind of creates that more agreeable person mm -hmm. um, for you to, you know, kind of, because now you're like, oh, well, I don't want to add to the conflict and I don't really want to have to deal with conflict. So I'm just going to become this agreeable person who's always, you know, pleasant and doesn't really work to offend people and all those things because there's already so many of those in your world that you're like, I don't want to add fuel to that fire. Because we want to make sure that we, you know, our coping skills gets us through the holidays. Now, if it's somebody that you have to deal with on a regular basis, I would handle it differently. You know what I mean? Um, we all need to be accountable for our actions and for our behavior, but you really need to pick the battle and the time. And especially the holidays is not the time to pick that battle. January 2nd, we could revisit it. <laughs> okay. Let's just get through the holidays. Because, I mean, think about it. How many of us dread the holidays? I do. 
it's, it's very stressful. You know, we've got to clean three days before, <laughs> you know, um, you know, it, there's a lot going on and just to get through those is, is, is hard because everybody's on edge and it's very stressful. Yes. There's some people that I saw that they take advantage of pretending to be drunk but then they utilize that just to abuse others. So they just drink a little bit and hey, do whatever you do, but I'm drunk, I'm not accounted. Yeah, so that's the, the that's issue. Yeah, the do. issue with drugs and alcohol is people use that as an excuse to b behave badly. And that is not an excuse. Um, who there, you know, there's, I remember, um, there was, there was a university, Beatrice, what university did that girl, was it Alabama, Kentucky, that was drunk and was cursing? UK. So there was a, a girl at UK who had gotten drunk and was, I think went back to her dorm or something and started cursing and acting out it wasn't even her dorm okay she was somewhere on campus <laughs> and she was drunk and she was cursing and she was using all kinds of profanity or she was using profanity and degrading terms the n-word all kinds of things and we're like i'm witch and i'm not going to get in trouble and blah 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 and you can't do anything to me because i'm rich and all of these things and my parents blah and I think she was a senior um, and she was being recorded Un unfortunate. Oh, she was, she was posting on social media saying this. No, well, she was posting oh, you know, what? I'm going to have my roommate come in and tell this story. <laughs> come on in. <laughs> She's going to take her hair down. <laughs> so what happened was I'm sure you'll find it all over um, social media. Uh, it's on Instagram. So I'm oh, sorry, that's my ESPN. Um, so basically what she did was she walked into this dorm room, uh, this uh, dorm, these dorms, and there was um, a freshman student, first semester student who was working the front desk. And they, she seen that the girl was struggling to try and open the elevator. So she peeked out and told her, you know, asked her if she needed help, if she was okay. And she wasn't responding initially. So she came out of behind that desk to help her. And then she was assaulted by this um, young lady named Sophia. She it was assaulted by her. She got kicked. She got punched. She got bit. And she kept calling her the N-word. And um, I happened to watch the whole thing. Um, and when the police finally came, she assaulted them as well. She kicked them, bit them and punched them. And then when they got her to the police station, she told them that basically they, there was no point in arresting her because nothing was going to happen to her because she, her family had money and that's it. She, she was going to do whatever she wanted anyway. So what ended up happening is she lost her job. She got kicked out of university of Kentucky and um, she's uh, waiting, awaiting trial, but she continuously, I've been watching her on Instagram. She's continually posting like, you guys are doing this to me. Um, I've already lost enough. You guys should give me a break now. Um, I've been banned from all these things. I've lost, you know, my education, uh, but she's blaming everybody else for it now when it was her, in fact her her herself and she's saying she was under the influence so she shouldn't be held accountable for any of it thank you b you're welcome and thank the, you. this is her thank latest you. post she said her latest post is you guys really got me banned recording me when i wasn't even aware that the whole this this was going to be my my whole future it's over i withdrew myself out of respect for everyone wanting me expelled but getting banned hurts i'm really sorry but i was under the influence and regret everything so but she did get kicked out of school she did not drop out 
Wow. So the, the whole purpose of that story was that drugs and alcohol are used in an excuse. I don't think that, I think uh, she was probably not a nice girl. Mm-hmm. Before you, you, before you were right. I mean, drunk. she would have known that she probably might have said it even if she was not drunk. She just used it as an excuse to cover for her behavior. Because I mean, yeah, maybe maybe alcohol like more, like I don't know, like more. It lowers expressive. your it, it, yeah. It, it lowers your filter, but yes. And why but. are you drinking that much to where you're gonna get that belligerent? Like, sweetheart, I think she needs to uh, maybe look at drug and alcohol counseling. Absolutely, that could have helped her and maybe made her more appealing to the public she apologized and agreed to go to like a counseling or something instead of attacking people too yeah interesting story thank you you're welcome i was just like as my roommate was telling me about this i'm like oh my goodness when she gets kicked out of school she's gonna who's where's she gonna go because in order for her transcripts to transfer She's going to have to tell that other university what happened, right? Mm -hmm. For people who are expelled, they're going to say, why were you expelled? So sometimes mm -hmm. people don't even transfer their credits over and they start all over again. Mm -hmm. That's hurtful. Hey, guys, we appreciate you and we appreciate from your friend. We got mm -hmm. two guests and we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jessica. <laughs> You are the mentor specialist here. What do you say about the presentation? Such a lame excuse, right? To use that to behave like, listen. And it's but it's very hard. common, right? For people to say, oh, I was stressed. I was tired. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, when you are stressed, you might, your, your threshold might be a little bit lower, but it mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you have the right to be a jerk. Yes. And also I'm now what I see is yeah, a lot of young people are talking about these things early in the early. So um, I think it's a good thing that we are opening these conversations to young people to kind of learn to filter these issues. I agree. But also looking at how other pers people's personalities and actions affect our own behavior, right? Because yeah. we are very reactionary. So if somebody is very friendly to you, you're going to be friendly. If somebody is very aggressive towards you, you might react in an aggressive manner. So being very aware of our responses to people's behavior is very important. Because I've learned that if, a, especially if customers come in yelling at me, I try. <laughs> Before I was like, Bleh. And now I'm just like, I try to calm down, but if it gets worse, like I, one day this man was just yelling at me and being horrible. <laughs> and I turned around, I said, what we're not going to do today, sir, is we're not going to be rude to me. And customers and my colleagues looked at me and customers were like, yes. Yes. it's like, well, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So you took him by surprise and, mm -hmm. so he and he just looked at me like what uh -huh. yeah he felt stupid after but he didn't <laughs> apologize but that's fine i just let him know we're not going to do this yeah well and that's what i think i mean you know you have to do those things to de-escalate a lot of the times because if you know you continue to just let them have at it. it just seems like the whole thing snowballs into these mm -hmm. situations that just become unbearable you know it's bad for the people who are around it's bad for you it just becomes this uh, situation that's just yucky so somebody has to be that de-escalation force and that's why we need to have that exit line like let me let you go <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely I hear my car alarm, whatever it is that you need to say. <laughs> and know that you can say no. It is okay to say no without giving it reason why. You can just say no. 
Nancy Reagan taught me that. Just say no. <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for guys so much us this evening. Thank you uh, for having me. It was my honor to be present this evening. Yes. So we really appreciate you and we want you to come back. But one more question before you leave. Uh, I know that you have been really focusing on these holidays and so on, but when should it be the exit line when you're looking at mainly family issues? Because oh, you're looking always, at- yeah. Always have an exit line when, it, when you're having, in any situation. You okay. know, you, you should not have to experience anything that is going to cause you harm or overwhelm your system. Okay. And your exit line can be anything. I hear, I hear my alarm. <laughs> I got to use the restroom, whatever it is, you know? Yes. Thank you so much. Anybody with any question before Dr. Katie goes, because we really appreciate And you can feel free it. to email me. Um, you, you can give them my email. Um, you can feel sure. free to reach out to email me if there's anything um, that you have questions on. If there's another topic you want me to present on, I will be more than happy to. Um, I've got 22 years of doing this, so. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We do this every uh, Wednesday, six to seven. And if you have friends, if you yourself, you can just tune in and join us. We have different topics and we will call you back and we want you also to get us some individuals who might be interested. And thank you so much. Have a good night thank and you. see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.